welcome back to a new post today and let's continue with the uh, series for uh, the economy this week uh, gone by for january 1st to 6th so in this uh, session uh, we will be tracking the most important uh, news with regard to your economy or your upsc gs mains paper 3 for the week from january 1st to 6 2000 and 24. Uh, in the last part uh, session, I had in the last video, I'm sorry, I had done the polity and governance for the week gone by for January 1st to 6th. And this to, in this today, in today's session, let's do uh, the economy part. So the very first uh, topic which is in news is about Prithvi Vigyan. Now this is a scheme of the government which is uh, used especially for studying the earth systems and therefore the cabinet took uh, the decision for, to implement an overarching scheme called as Prithvi Vigyan uh, and it comes encompasses five sub schemes they are the uh, atmosphere climate research modeling observation system and services uh, ocean services modeling application resources and technology polar sciences uh, cryosphere research and uh, seismology and geosciences along with research education training and outreach now the Prithvi, Prithvi scheme is uh, aimed at augmentation and sustenance of long term observations of the atmosphere ocean geosphere cryosphere and the solid earth to record vital signs of the earth system and also its changes. It is, it is intended to uh, for the development and modeling of the systems and understanding and predicting weather, ocean, climate hazards and understanding the sciences of climate change as well. So the earth system sciences deals with five components of the earth system. They are the atmosphere, hydrosphere, or the geosphere, cryosphere, biosphere and their complex interactions. The Ministry of Earth Sciences uh, holistically addresses all the aspects relating to the earth sciences and this scheme will especially help the primary sector of the economy especially agriculture which is very much influences with the changes happening in the atmosphere hydrosphere as well as the geosphere and the biosphere as well so this is just not uh, just not important from ecology point of view but also for the primary uh, uh, sector of the economy with reg with regard to fishing uh, agriculture and mining as well so this prithvi scheme is uh, set to be carried out in an integrated manner with combined efforts of all the institutes of the ministry of earth sciences this scheme will be developed it is a multidisciplinary scheme and also will help to address the challenges in weather and climate ocean cryosphere hydrosphere seismological sciences and services and also explore the living and non-living resources for the sustainable harvest harnessing of the uh, of the economy primary uh, uh, sector of the economy plays a very important role and is a feeder to the secondary and the tertiary sectors of the economy the next most important news is about India having its own uh, protection and identity entity. It's nothing but an insurance en uh, entity. So many of the shipping uh, ship owners and the container owners, especially largely the shipping, shipping sector, depends upon a third country for protection and identity. We do not have our own shipping or identity uh, entity for especially the shipping industry. And therefore, India is looking uh, looking to have its own PNI entity. Now, this will allow the ship owners and the op to option uh, the option to purchase open-ended high risk covers or insurance that the traditional players or the insurance companies are reluctant to provide so what exactly is open-ended risk now damages not only in involve the missionary the shipping or the cargo but they will also cover the risk of war uh, as and risk of environmental damage like oil spills pollution and also damage to the cargo during the carriage so it has a, it has a wider insurance cover than the conventional insurance sector and what exactly is pni so typically a protection and an identity insurance is a form of mutual maritime insurance provided by the entities which are technically called as a pni club now while many of the insurance companies provide only hull and missionary insurance to the ship owners and the cargo owners pni provides open-ended risk that is damage to the cargo during the carriage a war risk risk of environmental damage oil spills pollution etc Generally, the PNI club operates in a mutual insurance uh, association that provides of risk pooling, information and representation for its members and the club and, uh, is operated by the ship owners and the charterers themselves just like cooperative banking system. Now instead of an insurance premium, the PNI club pays something what is called. So rather than premium, they use the word call for it. This is a sum of money that is put into the club's pool and with the end of the year, there is still funds available in the pool. Each each member will have a reduced amount that they will have to be paying in the next year but if the club has a, a, has a major payout members may further call to replenish the pool with some more money 
previous attempts have been taken to provide a indian pni entity especially during the global maritime summit this was addressed by the finance minister nirmala sitaraman and market sources also say that such a move will help the indian ship protection against international sanctions especially when we depend on countries like russia for pni services from their companies which face sanctions in the international arena presently because of the russia ukraine war and now even because of the Pal israel and palestine issue so this is a welcome step that is being looking for, that is being uh, looked at and the next most important issue is with regard to your toy sector now the exports have increased to uh, to zoomed to 239 239 person and uh, there, uh, this is in in line with india the government of india having a goal of establishing india as a major toy manufacturing hub now there is also a national action plan for toys that has been released indian industry witnessed a 239 person increase in exports in 2022 and 23 compared to the last 10 years and this has been a case study by the department of promotion of industry and internal trade under the ministry of commerce in association with iim lucknow it also says that there has been a decline in imports by 52 person and in principle it says that the reason is because of inward protection that means there has been a rise in the import duties on the uh, toys that are being imported to reduce the demand of the toys imported so that because the import duties add to the price and the cost imposition of non tariff barriers can also shrink the uh, supply like quality control etc raising the prices and also reducing the demand alternatively investment has been boosted up now in the toy sector especially in india it also says that the government has been more conducive to the manufacturing ecosystem in the toy industry there has also been a gross increase in the sales of the toys from india and a reduction in the dependence from the imports apart from this now the ministry of msme is implementing a cluster based, uh, based approach for toy production there are some 19 toy clusters under the scheme for funds a uh, scheme of funds for further for regeneration of traditional industries of spurti and the ministry of textiles is providing tooling and designing support to 13 toy clusters now several promotional initiatives have been taken up to uh, promote indigenous toys and also encourage innovation including the indian toy fair of 2021 and also the toy caton etc other other steps have been taken up by the director general of foreign trade like it has mandated the sample testing of each import concern assignment coming so that the substandard toys are not allowed to enter the country a quality control order has been issued in 2020 bis has now granted more than 1200 license to the domestic manufacturers and more than 30 license uh, to the foreign manufacturers for man manufacturing of toys with bis standing marks therefore improving the standardization of toys not only in the local market but also in the international market as well and this has led to the increase in exports of toys to 3 uh, 200 and 39 person and the next most important issue is with regard to lithium reserves now india is looking uh, towards other countries apart from the traditional china for lithium supplies and kabul that is the kanji bidesh limited uh, limited uh, company kanji bidesh india limited company which is a joint venture of nalco mecl and hindustan copper now will invest in a five year period in lithium blocks in argentina which forms a part of the lithium triangle of the world along with chile and bolivia so the kabul bo board is sign an mou with kmen which is the psu of argentina taking over the exploration of lithium reserves in the fayambala region of argentina and chile and argentina in the lithium triangle account for 30 to 35 percent of the world supplies chile as 11 percent of the world's lithium reserves which is called as white gold and is an alkaline chemical and supplies 26% of the world's requirements argentina nearly 1/5 of the global resources and supplies 6% of the requirements lithium is also called as white coal and it is an alkaline mineral which is very very critical towards modern day energy storage solutions and it finds its usage in a number of uh, appliances and also vehicles like electric vehicles lithium ion batteries mobile phones among others and it is a cornerstone towards india's transition to green energy and also reduction of the country's carbon footprint as well and india now as uh, uh, india's lithium requir requirements are especially met through imports mostly china and the bill runs as high as 24000 crore rupees and india has recently found lithium uh, reserves in jammu and kashmir apart from that in chatisgarh and jharkhand rajasthan and karnataka as well the inferred lithium reserves of jammu and kashmir is stands about 5.9 million tons while chatisgarh is said to be explored yet and lithiums are found in under ground brine deposits mineral oils 
clears sea waters and geothermal well brines or water so this is about kabul investing in lithium reserves in overseas that is uh, the uh, argentina and we have the great nicobar project now uh, uh, now progressing so great nicobar transshipment project is in the final stage of completion it is to be developed in a public private partnership mode this is a very good example to give for your gs main paper 3 which speaks about public private partnership and the methodologies it also the proposed it also has a proposed international container transshipment which is about 44000 crores and it will have the capacity of 16 million 20 equivalent units and it will the entire port will be commissioned by 2058 strategically located between china between singapore and colombo two main transshipment hubs which are already used by india along with klang in myanmar it will be a feeder to this and also will tap the cargo coming from bangladesh and myanmar as well nearly 75% of india's transship cargo is handled by ports out of the country especially by colombo klang singapore and the proposed galatia bay port is strategically located between the east west shipping corridor of the world and is very very suitable to attract gateway and transship cargo corridor especially making a key participant in the international sea route from the eastern border uh, to Russia China Japan Philippines Southeast uh, China Sea all along with the strait of Malacca towards South Asia South Asia involving Ch uh, India Sri Lanka the the uh, the littoral countries all along towards the West Asia and going up to Europe so the proposed hub is just 40 nautical miles away uh, from the international sea route and the location as a draft of 20 meters making it very very capable to handle very big containers and adequate berthing for large ships as well the existing terminals of the route include singapore klang and colombo as i've told you and the first phase will focus on developing infrastructure for port facilities let me tell you that the government is using a landlord model so what exactly is a landlord model which has already been used in ports like cochin Landlord model is nothing but where the port authority owns the basic infrastructure, leasing it out to the operators, mostly on a long-term concession basis, where all while retaining all the regulatory power. The port of the, uh, operators are carried out by the private companies, which provide and maintain their own super infrastructure on the basic infrastructure, including the build buildings and the cargo handling equipment. Now, development of this Galatia Bay transshipment hub will uh, give immense benefits to India, like forex. savings foreign direct investment increase economic activity uh, development of other ports development of related logistic infrastructure employment generation in the shipping sector and the backward and the forward industries improving operation and logistics efficiencies increase in the revenue of the government and several allied sectors like the chandlery uh, ship supply ship repair ship crew uh, uh, the ch uh, crew changing facility logistics valued added services warehouses bunkering etc will get a major major boost now transshipment hubs apart from the galatia bay are being planned in cochin wisingam and visakhapatnam along with the galatia bay in great nicobar so this is about the great nicobar project and its advantages and another most important issue to track with is the cc the competition commission of india report speaking about the restrictions that india should do on the exports of iron ore for our atmanirbhar bharat now the competition competition commission of india commissioned a study called as dynamics of the competition in the mining sector in india with focus on iron ore the report says that exports of the iron ore should be encouraged it should not be encouraged because it is a non renewable material instead it, uh, india should adopt the china strategy of importing the raw material and actually selling away the ready steel material by discouraging exports we can actually increase the domestic supply which is crucial bearing in mind the atmanirbhar bharat plan of the government it also includes India should prioritize high value added products like finished steel it also says to address the problem of low grade iron ore and once the iron ore exports are discouraged india should implement cutting edge technologies especially to deal with low grade iron ore with benefaction uh, benefa uh, benef beneficial processes etc the study also says that the government should change the duty structure on iron ore to uh, help the local industry and it noted that india is self sufficient in iron ore resources and therefore should stop exporting iron ore 
sure so that it is helpful to the local uh, advantage to the local firms so this is what the competition commission of india studies says the name of the report is dynamics of competition in the mining sector in india with focus on iron ore you can take a look at this and the most important other issue with regard to steel itself that is related to iron ore is now that the steel mints want protection from the imports of china because they are facing flooding uh, imports a cheap cost steel from china and therefore they called upon the government of india to include steel under a duty remission scheme or called as rodtep or remission of duties uh, for tra uh, for trade scheme which is run by the ministry of commerce and therefore the the there has been a recent rise in imports of steel from china especially along with vietnam that to cheap steel this is also called as dumping of steel into the local market they say that import of non prime material is also a matter of concern this violates the quality control orders and along with that non prime steels are imported into india at very very low prices and then they are rerouting this steel uh, which are violating the free trade agreement rules as well and therefore the the steel sector has asked them to uh, come up with a scheme to uh, to, pro, to come up with steps like imposition of 8 to 12 percent of taxes on the imported steams under something called as the Bharat Border Adjustment Mechanism, or which is developed online the Euro, uh, European Union's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. It is a carbon tax that is imposed on the goods that have, use high energy intensity and more of carbon emissions to produce, like steel, aluminium, etc. So Bharat Border Adjustment Mechanism. Has been called on to be implemented to impose 8 to 12 percent of the duty on the imported steel so that the local industry is protected. So, this is about the steel making a demand to the Ministry of Commerce about the about the safeguards that it needs and the next most important issue is with regard to your uh, demands for grants so recently the government has called upon uh, the final leg of demand for grants for the government supplementary demands of grants so supplementary demand of grants are are asked when the expenditure is more than the got uh, than the amount that was uh, bought uh, got to the ministry through the appropriation bill and therefore we have different types of demand for grants let me tell you that article 113 of the constitution deals with demand for grants so so the the demands for grants is usually prepared in two ways first of all it clearly distinguishes the charge expenditure from the voted expenditure and it also classifies the expenditure as capital expenditure and revenue expenditure capital expenditure really re relates to creation of some assets while the revenue expenditure are operational in nature in addition it gives a breakup of the charged and the voting expenditure as well and revenue uh, and capital uh, uh, revenue and capital expenditure a demand for grant also gives a gross estimate of the total expenditure to be in good it also gives the following details like breakup of the expenditure under different heads of accounts listing out the recoveries to be made and the net amount of expenditure after deducting the recoveries now demands of grants are introduced after the recommendation of the president uh, the 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 they, no demand for grant can be introduced in the parliament without the recommendation of the president that's what they can be introduced only on the recommendation of the president under article 113 of the constitution and therefore because we have an interim budget now coming up and not a full-fledged budget therefore the supplement the finance ministry was see seeking the final lead of the supplementary demands of grants that is those ministries which have additional expenditure than the already approved expenditure last time in the last budget through the appropriation bill and the next most important issue is with regard to India is now said to be the largest coal importer by 2026, something of a dampening goal for the government of India's climate change goals, especially uh, for net zero targets. So as a positive side, the, you can see it as a growing industrialization and therefore there is a rise in demand of coal. But on the negative side, we, we have to conclude that coal definitely is still the major uh, energy uh, usage or the form for industrial activities. And imports in India are said to be increased by 2026 to 16 million tons driven by increase in steel production via and also increase in other economic activities like uh, by, like energy production as well. India is will once more become the world's largest net coal importer. This shows that coal is a main uh, and that is the reason why coal is also the main, uh, main target for climate action. China's imports uh, along with India are set to increase as well. So benefiting from the price rise recently, India has displaced Australia by adopting to for Russia coal. So displacing Australia 
Australia. Now, Russia has become the largest supplier of coal in India and uh, uh, both India and China are uh, are importing a lot of coal from Russia rather than Australia. There are about uh, India. If you look, look at the look at the reserves in India, it sees that uh, India has about 352 billion metric tons of coal reserves and coal is mainly found in West Bengal, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Telangana, Maharashtra region apart from Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Rajasthan and certain peat deposits of Jammu and Kashmir. So this is about the increase in economic activity uh, indirectly being uh, concluded because of the demand in rice and coal by 2026. Good for the economy but definitely a dampener for the climate change goals of the government. And another most important with regard to uh, energy itself is that ONGC uh, Krishna Godavari Basin is set to start gas production once again. So in 2024 the Krishna Godavari Basin which lies off the coast of Andhra Pradesh is to gain regain some of its lost glory. Anytime new the public sector giant called as ONGC will commence the oil production from its deep water KG 98 basin. Gas production from the project has already commenced in March 2020 and uh, this will be ramped up in 2024 therefore less of imports. So the, uh, the basin that has operated a uh, KG 92, uh, a KG uh, D6 basin by the OGN, ONGC and KG, uh, yeah, so the, you have three to flow clusters in this operated by the ONGC. So ONGC is to start production on almost three to four wells and the initial production is about 8,000 to 9,000 barrels per day. And the first consignment is to be to the Mangalore Refinery and Petrochemicals Limited. Peak oil output expect, expect that 45 barrels per day and uh, this would definitely help India to become a little bit of self-reliant on the gas and the petroleum production and reduce its dependence on um, uh, imports, not a major part but at least a minuscule. And apart from that, we have 16 finance commission for, uh, formed by uh, the chairman of uh, the former member of Niti Ayod Arvind Panagriya. So we have him as a finance commission chairman and he is set to sub, uh, submit the report on 2025 and then uh, the, uh, the, the period of the report will commence from April 1st, 2026. So we know that the finance commission is a constitutional body under article 280 and main role of the finance commission is to decide on distribution of taxes between the union and states that is the net proceeds of this taxes, uh, the allocation between the union and the states of such proceeds. The principles that govern the grants and aids of the revenues of the state outside the Consolidated Fund of India and the grants and aids or, uh, and also the sums to be paid to the states out, uh, out of these grant in aid revenues and the measures to be taken to augment or to uh, improve the Consolidated Fund of the state to supplement the resources of the Panchayat and the municipalities and 15 Finance Commission was chaired by N.K. Singh. So please take a look at what are the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission, especially they came up with 41% devolution of taxes and certain more important features with regard to your urban and local uh, government grants, etc. So, this is about the economic news for the week from January 1st to 6th, and I shall see you with a next set of important issues for January uh, 7th to 12th in my next post with both polity and governance and if you did please do like share subscribe and don't forget to comment and i shall see you in my next post until then it's very happy learning